on February 18, 1930, a young astronomer named Clyde Tonebaugh was looking at these two images of the night sky when he discovered the planet Pluto. About a year before, the director of the Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff, Arizona, had tasked the young Clyde with conducting a search for Planet X, a hypothetical planet that he thought was lurking beyond the orbit of Neptune. By taking images of the sky separated by a few days, Clyde was exploiting the fact that objects in our solar system appear to move relative to the background stars as we all orbit around our sun. So can you see Pluto in this image? I, I never can either. <laughs> a tiny speck of light that moved over six days. Clyde spent a year looking at pairs of images like this, looking for this speck of light. I guess I'm not loud enough. All right, let's go with that. Pluto, for much of, sorry. <laughs> Pluto, for much of the 20th century, was the most distant object known in the solar system. But in the 1990s, astronomers began to find icy bodies out beyond the orbit of Neptune. And we now call this the Kuiper Belt. Clyde had no idea that 70 years later, his discovery of Pluto would cause Neil deGrasse Tyson, the director of the Hayden Planetarium in New York City, to get hate mail from third graders. <laughs> Once we found these objects out beyond the orbit of Neptune, Neil felt, because Pluto never really fed in, fit in with the other planets, and now it had friends orbiting at a similar distance from the sun, that Pluto really wasn't a planet anymore. And so he removed it from the museum's display of the big planets. A New York Times reporter overheard a young child talking to his mother saying, I can't find Pluto. And he thought, wow, you're right, it's gone. And so he wrote a front page article called Pluto, Not a Planet, Only in New York. <laughs> and that opened up the floodgates of the hate mail from the third graders, a sampling of which includes, why do you think Pluto is not a planet? I don't like your answer. <laughs> Why can't Pluto be a planet? Please write back, but not in cursive, because I can't read cursive. I think Pluto is a planet, and I took a poll of 11 people. These are actual letters. You can go online and, and read them. The story of Pluto's demise is a useful one, because it reminds us we always have to question our assumptions in the light of new data. Astronomers to this day are still arguing about whether or not Pluto is a planet. And in many ways, it comes down to a simple question. How small is too small? Jupiter, clearly a planet. Neptune, clearly a planet. Earth, clearly a planet. A comet, not a planet. Pluto falls in between. Is it a planet? It's hard to say. Astronomers are having a similar, albeit less public debate, about how massive you have to be in order to not be a planet. For much of the 20th century, the difference between a star like our sun and a planet like Jupiter was clear to everyone. Stars generate their own energy, their own light, by fusing light elements like hydrogen into heavier elements like helium, and planets like Jupiter simply don't. Around the same time the first Kuiper Belt object was found, astronomers found an object that fell in between planets and stars, a so-called brown dwarf. The term was actually coined by an astronomer named Jill Tarter, who works on SETI, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. She was actually the inspiration for the Jodie Foster character in the movie Contact, if any of you saw that. Unlike stars, brown dwarfs don't generate their own energy. They don't fuse hydrogen into helium, and so they simply cool off over time, like an ember plucked from a fire. And so they might be red hot when they're young, but eventually they become cold, and black. And so she thought brown was a color in between red and black, and so she picked brown. And the name is just kind of stuck. Astronomers are not known for naming things in good ways. <laughs> brown dwarfs blur the previously clear distinction between a star and a planet. In some ways, they're like stars. We think they form like stars from the gravitational collapse of an enormous, diffuse cloud of gas and dust. 
They can actually fuse some light elements, like lithium, into heavier elements for some fraction of their lifetime. But in more ways, they're much more like gas giant planets like Jupiter and Saturn. Their atmospheres are composed of water vapor, methane, and ammonia, just like Jupiter and Saturn, and for Earth, that matter. Um, they have clouds, just like Jupiter, Saturn, and Earth, except their clouds are made of sapphire and ruby and potassium chloride and liquid iron drops. And so there's a reason why the artist's rendition of a brown dwarf looks so much like Jupiter. It's because we really do think these things look like Jupiter. They start with Jupiter and then they sort of tweak it a little bit. But finding them is a very difficult thing to do for two reasons. The first is that they're intrinsically very faint. They're millions of times less luminous than our sun. A second issue is that they don't emit a lot of visible light, the kind that the light bulbs in this room are reading, the kind that your eyes are sensitive to, and the kind of light that astronomers have used for centuries to study the universe. Hot objects like the sun, stars, and light bulbs emit lots of visible light. Cooler objects like brown dwarfs and planets and even humans emit almost no visible light but lots of infrared light. And so looking for brown dwarfs is very much like looking for a human hiding in a dark vault. You can't see them because they're not emitting any light that your eye is sensitive to. But if you look in the infrared, the person is obvious because they're emitting copious amounts of infrared light. The same thing is true for brown dwarfs. And so here is a patch of the sky in the visible, what your eye would see if you put your eye to a telescope. And here's the same patch of sky in the infrared. Can you spot the brown dwarf? It's easy. My research group at the University of Toledo focuses on discovering brown dwarfs and also trying to interpret their basic properties by studying the infrared light that they emit. To find them, we use a NASA satellite called the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, or WISE for short. This is a satellite that takes pictures of the entire sky in infrared. About a year ago, a postdoctoral researcher in my group, Adam Schneider, and an undergraduate student at UT named James Windsor, discovered a new brown dwarf using these data that now blurs the line between what is a brown dwarf and what is a planet. Its name, unceremoniously, is WISE 1147 minus 2040. <laughs> so we'll go with WISE 1147 for short. They did this using a technique very similar to what Clyde did to find Pluto. All the stars you see in the night sky, our sun, and all the other stars in our galaxy are all moving relative to each other. And so, from our perspective on Earth, it looks like the stars are moving ever so slightly on the sky. Nearby stars move quickly on the sky, but far away stars move much, much slower on the sky. It's very much like driving down the highway, looking out your window, and seeing the guardrail zipping by, because it's five feet from your window. But the mountain off in the distance is sitting still and hardly moving at all. Because brown dwarfs are so faint, they have to be very close for us to see them. And so they're the guardrail of the universe, and we can look for them by watching them move on the sky. And so this is exactly what Adam and James did. And they found this object, WISE 1147. But it was only a candidate brown dwarf. We didn't know if it was a real brown dwarf. And so we had to get additional observations from a telescope in Hawaii. Now you might think, ooh, Hawaii. <laughs> they get to fly to Hawaii, maybe do a little surfing, go to a luau, right? Then we ascend this 14,000 foot dormant volcano that pokes out of the middle of Hawaii. We sit and we watch this beautiful sunset, waiting for the night to come so we can open the slit of the telescope, let light fall on our telescope and get the data that we want to confirm this. Unfortunately, they invented this thing called the internet. <laughs> and this is now how astronomy is done. <laughs> So we sit in my drab office in Toledo with fluorescent lights and donuts and orange juice and we control the telescope remotely. So this is what Adam and James did and when they got the data it confirmed that indeed yes this was a brown dwarf. This is what an artist thinks it looks like. Again, kind of like Jupiter, right? Very similar to Jupiter. So why should you care about this? I've already, you know, we know of a thousand of these things. Why is this one so interesting? And it turns out it comes down to its mass, how massive the thing is. There are well-known relations between the intrinsic brightness of a star, its wattage, if you will, and how massive it is. You tell me how bright something is, what its wattage is, 
I can tell you how massive it is. Brown dwarfs are a problem because they don't generate their own energy like stars do. And so they cool off and become fainter over time. And so you have to know the age of a brown dwarf in order to figure out its mass. And that's why this one is special. It's because it moves through the universe with about 20 or 30 other stars that we call an association. We know the age of this association is about 10 million years old, and so we make the reasonable inference that Y's 1147 is also 10 million years old. We now know its age and we can get its mass. And it turns out it's only five to 10 times the mass of Jupiter. For reference, the sun is 1,000 times the mass of Jupiter. So this thing is very, very low mass. Turns out they had discovered one of the least massive and youngest brown dwarfs ever known. And here's why it blurs the line between brown dwarfs and planets. It's because if this object had been discovered orbiting another star, it would be a planet, case closed. And in fact, we've imaged other stars with planets orbiting around it that have the same mass as this object. So is it a planet? It's not orbiting a star. It's kind of out there in space. So maybe we, would, maybe we can call it like a free-floating planet. Or maybe it was a planet at one point, and through some cataclysmic event, like a nearby star passing by that gravitationally ripped it off and threw it out into space. So it's still a planet, but it's not really around a star. So maybe we call it a rogue planet. <laughs> or maybe it just is a brown dwarf. It just formed like stars do. And so we just call it a brown dwarf. The problem is that we don't know enough about its origin to be able to distinguish between these four particular cases. The wonderful thing about science is that we're continually finding new things, discovering new knowledge that forces us to reevaluate how we understand the universe. 25 years ago, the difference between a star and a planet was obvious to everyone. And now I sit here today and I can't give you a simple definition of what a planet is. This may seem frustrating to a lot of people. It certainly did to all the third graders. <laughs> but I find it exciting because it means the universe is more complex, more interesting, more strange than our simple theories and our simple minds can come up with. It may be that the universe really can create objects like Wise 1147 in two different ways. And so what do we do in the meantime? Well, I typically fall back to a, a, a principle called Occam's razor that scientists often use. It basically states that if you have two hypotheses that are trying to explain some data or some observations, you go with the hypothesis that is simpler, the one that has fewer assumptions. And that one is probably the right one. So if you force me to, to answer the question, is Wise 1147 a planet, I'm going to have to say, based on what we know now, no. It's probably just a really low mass brown dwarf. But I'm OK with that, because it means I have more work to do with my students, with my postdocs. Other astronomers and I around the world will spend our time looking for more of these objects so that we can better understand their properties and maybe someday be able to say, this one's a rogue planet or this one is a brown dwarf. And so my hope is that I'll be able to come back to, say, Toledo TEDx 2030 and say, I was wrong. Why is 1147 is actually a planet? Thank you.